Well, last year, the FDA's accelerated approval pathway fast-tracked drugs targeting cancer, type 2 diabetes, and rare diseases. How are patient groups responding to the current discussion surrounding accelerated approvals? Well, let's find out. Cynthia Rice is Chief Mission Strategy Officer at JDRF, a type 1 diabetes patient advocacy group. Neil Thacker is Chief Mission Officer at the ALS Association. ALS is also called Lou Gehrig's disease. And Jamie Sullivan is Senior Director for Policy at Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. Thank you for, for joining us. Uh, Cynthia, I want to start with you. The, the mission of your group, JDRF, is to accelerate life-changing breakthroughs. What progress have we made in recent years, and, and what progress do we, do we need to make in the coming years? Well, thanks to significant investment from both the public and the private sector uh, over several decades, we now have multiple human clinical trials uh, for better treatments, as well as cures for type 1 diabetes. Um, and many of those are in uh, regulatory review. We've also had tremendous progress in the last decade in, in better technologies to help people live better with the disease. But our ultimate goal is cures. And that involves um, moving things forward from early stage discovery uh, to translational research into human clinical trials and through the regulatory and reimbursement processes. Uh, Neil, going to you, uh, the FDA uh, recently has delved into a, a new treatment for, for ALS, and ALS is just a devastating disease. I've known a couple people recently who passed away, including former Congressman Walter Jones, who I knew well from ALS. Uh, what did you think of the FDA's uh, recommendation, and where do you think they should go from here as far as new breakthrough therapies? You mean the recommendation on the new uh, ALS drug? Yes. Well, the, so the FDA recently had an advisory committee meeting, and that, of course, isn't binding. That's advisory to the FDA. And it, it, was, it was really interesting. This, this drug is showing a lot of promise. Uh, I think the community is very excited about it. It's the first new treatment that's coming from uh, the Ice Bucket Challenge uh, investments that were made into new research. And so... Um, it's the first drug we're seeing in a new in a long time that's showing actual evidence of clinical improvement, not improvement, but slowing of progression, and also an increase in length of life. Uh, what the the committee though was was asked a really interesting question, um, where, where it was really asking them to to have certainty. Um, do, do the data from this uh, single randomized control trial and the open label extension established conclusion that this drug is effective in the treatment of patients with ALS. And, and you have to remember the context of, of ALS, it's a rare disease, it moves very, very quickly, people only have a few years to live, and it's fatal. And so certainty in a rare disease means that you have to run many more years of trials, most likely. And that's the way the, co the committee found they, they voted it was a mixed vote, but they, they reluctantly decided uh, not to recommend under that question. But that's not the question. The, the, the question that uh, an ALS clinician faces is, um, do we have enough, do we know enough about the safety and efficacy of this drug to make it a treatment option uh, for physicians who, who care for people with ALS? That's a different question, and it gets to the role of the FDA. The role of the FDA is to advance the health of the American people. And um, maybe they asked the wrong question, but it's, it's just a recommendation. So they still have the chance, I think, to approve this drug and make it available to, to people with ALS. A uh, quick follow up on that, Neil. Um, many years ago, when I covered healthcare, uh, ALS was added to Medicare coverage by Congress in 2001. Uh, that was a very powerful lobbying effort at the time. It wasn't easy back then. Um, but, I, but because of the Medicare, this, you know, we've been talking all day about FDA's role and CMS's role uh, is, is, you know, because you, you have to get a drug approved. And if it's very expensive, and usually they are in the beginning, certainly, you've got to get it paid for. H how, how is the role between uh, FDA and CMS? Could you see improvements there? Do you think the process is working as designed? Well, it's, it's strange, right? They're, they're supposed to be separate. But I think the expectation that everyone has is that once FDA approves a drug, people are going to be able to access it. 
and a, I think a very disturbing trend that not just uh, within CMS but outside of CMS is we're we're trying to control the price of drugs by limiting access to those drugs, and that's that's just not a great uh, approach. Um, if we have a drug and we think it has benefit, then a doctor and a patient should be able to work those things out together and those drugs should be affordable and accessible. And especially when we've identified systemic bias all throughout our health system to have different kinds of barriers uh, to getting a drug, uh, who's gonna be affected most? It's the people who, who aren't well served in our health system uh, in general. And so this is, a, I think, a, a disturbing trend Hopefully CMS and FDA can align, but it's that's just, I think, one one example of the challenges of getting access to a medication. I'm, I'm sure you've experienced, I'm sure everyone has experienced this, this sort of triangle we get between our, our payer and our pharmacist and our doctor, where everyone is saying, we just need one more decision or one more piece of paper from the other person before you get your medication, and we just need our medication. And for, for you know people like me, it's annoying. Uh, but if you have a, a, a serious illness where you have trouble communicating or moving around and you can't just drive to the drugstore and wait in line and, and work it through, um, these, are, these are pretty serious concerns. Uh, Jamie, when we're talking about rare diseases, uh, when you use the word rare, uh, there are many rare diseases. Uh, but as far as people getting rare diseases, not so rare. Uh, I believe the stats are 1 in 10 uh, have a rare disease. How do you think the process is in this country of, number one, the accelerated pathway process? Uh, how could that be strengthened? And, and how could the overall process uh, be strengthened that of government policymakers, Congress, so that patients can get the treatment that they need, even if they are not perfect uh, and, of course, are going to be controversial at first? Sure. Well, thanks. So I think that first and foremost, we know that based on the, how the accelerated approval pathways transformed outcomes in HIV AIDS and cancer care, that it's working uh, as intended, as Congress intended, uh, and that reforms really should unleash that potential to help those with the unmet need with serious illness. Uh, and we know that rare diseases are that. Uh, we know 95% of rare diseases, there's about seven to 10,000 of them, don't have any approved treatments. And we need to get options and hope to those patients uh, as soon as possible. So um, we have you know, really been working on developing some accelerated approval related solutions, but also on, as you mentioned on, on the process overall. And I think it's important just to, to note that therapies for rare diseases are really developed for complex uh, populations. There's no one size you know, fits all solution and that the standards you know, of, of approval are going to be um, really have to take into account the population that they are being developed for. And um, ultimately we have been thinking through uh, reforms to the accelerated approval that will support the prioritization and resources that are necessary to better understand rare disease endpoints. If you look at the therapies approved in cancer using accelerated approval, there's about two biomarkers that are used and those are very well understood. Um, why we're not having this conversation about some of the uh, accelerated approvals in oncology is that the payers understand those biomarkers. They understand what they mean, um, the science behind them. And in rare disease, that's not necessarily the case. So let's invest now in that evidence generation, in that better understanding of biomarkers to help improve the process overall. We know that we can strengthen uh, the confirmatory trial process through more frequent engagement uh, with the agency, through um, better use of tools like real world evidence, which you've heard today. Uh, and that we know we can still protect the statutory roles of the agencies, of FDA, of CMS, while facilitating earlier and more frequent engagement. So those are just a few of the ways we think we can move forward. Um, we know that we need to, to strengthen um, the coordination and collaboration within the FDA on, on rare disease issues across divisions, across centers. And we need to make sure that the FDA is bringing in the right expertise, uh, the right rare disease experts into the process as well. 
Uh, and continuing the interactive theme, we do have another question uh, from someone watching, and this one comes from Jessica Nickran, and this can really be answered by anybody or multiple people. Let's, let's have a listen. Hi, my name is Jessica Nickran, and I'm a program manager at the Child Neurology Foundation, where we support the one in five children experiencing neurologic conditions and their families. We know, too, that 90% of rare disorders have a neurologic component. So my question is, how will this accelerated pathway affect the childhood rare disease community? Thanks so much for your time. Anyone want to tackle that one? Yeah, I, you know, it's a really great question. And I think for a rare disease, there's, and it's oftentimes really hard to do certain kinds of research. It can be hard or very slow to collect real world evidence. Um, sometimes the biomarkers aren't identified. And so I think it's important that we're flexible in our approach and we focus on the, the clinical benefit that we can achieve for people who are living with these diseases. So if there is a clear case of clinical benefit, the accelerated pathway as it's, as it's written usually doesn't apply because there's no intermediate clinical endpoint or biomarker. And that makes it a challenge. Um, but the FDA I think has shown um, for example, in the ALS clinical trial guidance in 2019, that they're willing to be flexible because they recognize the severity of the illness and they're supposed to be taking into account the, the, all the treatment options that are available for people living with that disease. I think one of the key challenges that may be limiting their flexibility uh, or their risk tolerance is that it's really hard to take a drug off the market if it turns out not to have an effect in the future. And so if the FDA uh, had a simpler process to take a drug off the market, they might be more willing uh, to, to approve a drug in the first place. Uh, Cynthia, as far as um, uh, Neil talked about bias and, and barriers and, and mm -hmm. diversity, um, diversity in clinical trials, diversity in, in, in helping patients uh, uh, who are represent across the, po the political spectrum as well as race, how are we doing there? Because that's not something that really has been in the lexicon until more recently in recent years, uh, but now it's getting a lot of attention. How much progress are we making on that issue? Well, it's a challenging, it's a challenging circumstance for many people. So for people who have type one diabetes, you know, they need to use insulin multiple times a day just to stay alive. And insulin is very expensive in the marketplace right now. And it means that someone with type 1 diabetes needs regular care from their doctor and they need, you know, um, uh, insulin uh, available to them, you know, 24 seven and, and ideally, you know, devices to help them. So it's especially challenging for, for people who, who, who don't have regular health care, who, who are underinsured or, or uh, uninsured. And so one of the reasons why JDRF has made insulin affordability such a, a top priority is to make sure that everyone, you know, whether they have insurance or not, can, can afford uh, the life-saving uh, treatment that insulin is. Um, insulin though is, is not a cure and uh, people still have a very, um, it, it, you know, life with type one diabetes is still very challenging, you know, even, even with insulin and people have, you know, long-term and, and, and short-term uh, very significant health outcomes. So that's why we're also focused on, on investing, you know, in research and working with the National Institutes of Health and Congress and the FDA and CMS and all the other acronyms to help move a new, new research forward. And it's, you know, especially important um, that we make sure that, you know, as research moves forward, that, that everyone who wants to participate in clinical trials has, has access uh, to that. So we have information on our website, both in terms of how to, how to access um, programs to help people afford uh, insulin and, and other therapies that they need, and, and also to participate in clinical trials, because we want, you know, everyone to, to benefit from what's currently available. But it's critical that as we, you know, move forward with clinical trials and move forward with the FDA, that we make sure that 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 um, these therapies are reaching everyone. Which is why we're spending so much time and, and and energy on not only the research part of it, but the regulatory and the reimbursement pathways. Uh, Jamie, just want to ask you a quick question. We've got about thirty seconds left. Just on something at the federal uh, or state level or community level that you've seen as kind of a good model for for healthcare policymakers. Uh, to, to mimic some kind of good news that you think, hey, that program's working, maybe uh, people should look at that program. 
Well, uh, let's tough question in 30 seconds, but I, I think the accelerated approval pathway is working as it intended. You know, we have examples uh, in the rare disease community of a rare lung disease where the treatment was approved on a biomarker of culture conversion, and it meant that patients got access to a therapy that was reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit, meaning they, they would feel better. Uh, they would breathe better in the future, have fewer exacerbations, and it was done with the accelerated approval pathway. And why should those, should we have made those patients wait to progress in an irreversible disease and a progressive disease? Uh, no, the, that, that pathway has worked many times and it can continue to work, but we have to avoid policies that are going to um, really stifle that potential moving forward. And so mm -hmm. I would say I turn us right back to our topic today and say the accelerated approval pathway is working. That's not to say there aren't reforms that we can explore together that will really strengthen and protect the program moving forward. Great points uh, all around. I, I want to uh, thank uh, Cynthia Rice, Chief Mission Strategy Officer at JDRF, Neil Thacker, Chief Mission Officer at the ALS Association, and Jamie Sullivan, Senior Director for Policy at Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. Thanks so much. Thank you.